not easy. It's dangerous. It hasn't been done before. But these are the sorts of things that capture people's imaginations. Let's talk about the future of space exploration. Hey everybody, I'm here with my friend and space engineer, Bob Akfordowski. So I just spoke to Boss Landstorp of Mars One yeah. Project. Are you familiar with that? Very familiar. Okay, so, so what do you think about that? I mean, would you go to Mars? I, you know, the thing is, I would love to go to Mars, but not on a one-way trip. I love, I'm a big fan of the planet Earth. I like my coffee in the morning. I like people around me. Um, I think the people, you know, who, who want to go to Mars on a one-way trip, they're going to have to be a very special group of people who are comfortable in a small space with four, eight other people, or seven other people, I guess, really. Uh, and that's going to be pretty intense. And uh, I can't imagine, there's, I love a lot of people here at home. I love my parents, but I can't imagine being in a small room with them for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be a little tough. But I, you know what? I, I love the enthusiasm that, that Mars One is bringing to the Mars exploration. I think that the public is excited for it. And I like that whole, you know, the thing that would kind of an exciting moment for humans is maybe we're, we're going to go colonize another planet. Certainly. Now, knowing what you know about Mars and about how difficult it may or may not be to go there and survive there, I mean, what do you think is their, their biggest challenge? You know, I think the biggest challenge is going to be logistics. It's, it's all about being able to carry all the supplies in advance, uh, not necessarily everything you need to survive, but everything that needs to be, you know, developing water, you know, creating water, creating oxygen out of the atmosphere, uh, growing plants. All those, you know, systems have to be there before the first human is on their way because, you know, you want to, when you leave the Earth, it's a one-way trip. So you want to know that everything is waiting for you, working, uh, and ready to go when you get there because it's it's not the kind of thing where you're like, oh, I changed my mind and I'm right. just going to turn around the car and come back. Well, I think actually they're relying on the people that they send to build the infrastructure. I think that's part of the plan. Well, they definitely, and they'll have to, but I think at the same time, you know, it's, it'll be a, an interesting mix of things you can do in advance robotically, you know, and the things that you can do once you're there that, you know, humans need to be more technically involved in. But uh, you know, at some level, you have to prove out all these technologies in the first time. And we, you know, we're still learning about that with space exploration, um, and Mars One has that plan too, right? To spend smaller spacecraft first, prove out these ideas work, and then scale it up for, for people. All right. Let's say, not Mars One, but somehow, you got a ticket yeah. to go to Mars, and then you could actually come back. Yeah. But it would be very dangerous, take a long time. Right. Uh, you know. You <sighs> I think it's it's a lot more tempting, um, and you know I just read the The Martian, and I'm like, yeah, could I could I survive on the like the, you know the Mars environment for a year or whatever? Um, I I think I'm I would I would probably take that chance. <laughs> I know it's risky, you know. I mean, historically, spacecraft have like a 50 50 you know per, like percent chance of landing on the surface successfully. Um, let alone we've Wait, never nobody said that. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Bosch did not mention <laughs> anything like that yeah, so in no, his I, interview. Historically, you count the Russian and the American missions, it's yeah. about 50-50 that you land safely on the planet, and no one has really ever tried to take something off the planet of Mars. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's the, the scary thing, um, too, because you have to not only get there safely, but you have to have a rocket you know, on the ground to get back right. up into space. There's no launch space. pad, there's no nothing right. there. All of this will be a first. But then again, you know, this is kind of the cool thing, right? You have companies like SpaceX who are doing some of those things here on Earth already, right? We're proving that you could build rockets that can land, you know, autonomously without, you know, really large infrastructure, uh, and then, you know, potentially the next step is to lift, you know, right back up and carry people this time. All right, let's talk about. So, you know, talking about autonomous rockets landing, there's a company called Astrobotic, and their whole idea is that they're going to to be a delivery service for the moon. Yeah. What do you think about that? I, I like these ideas. I think that we're, we're seeing, you know, the, the breakdown, I guess, of, of what was historically maybe a NASA or, you know, large government institution that kind of done things into pieces that people can then utilize, right? And the, the idea is, you know, if it's just kind of in the same way that SpaceX is changing the way we, you know, maybe launch things and bringing the cost down, then that means that people who are like, I just want to put a thing in space that gives Wi-Fi to my town or does whatever you enable all these things. So the idea that, you know, the moon is this kind of an awesome idea, right? If you, if you think about it, it's a nice, stable platform. It doesn't really have an atmosphere. 
Um, you could put all kinds of very cool telescopes and observatories and everything up there. Um, and these are whole, you know, essentially markets that never existed until, until a company comes along and says, we can do this. We'll get you there. You just need to build a thing that sits there and, and does what it's going to do. We haven't been back to the moon since the 60s. Is there more that we can learn from going back to the moon? Well, the moon, I mean, scientifically, the moon's kind of an interesting place because it, it does show a, a different part of the history than, than what we see on Earth. Or Earth has been you know, heavily weathered. And, and the moon surfaces certainly, but you know you can you can get beyond the, the shallow surfaces and have the weathering problems of plants and water problems. I say, but those are the things we like about our, our planet. Um, and then uh, you know, so there's there's definitely some value. Um, there are missions you know still at the moon right now that are doing lunar reconnaissance orbit or things like that that are understanding um, uh, the moon. But I think the the more exciting you know part of the moon is really as this kind of the, the you know the launch pad for other things, right? It's it's near Earth. It's a very reasonable place to get to, um, and it doesn't have you know the heavy gravity of Earth. So if you can get things there, it's a nice stable platform. I mean, I still have a dream of like a, a Hubble-like telescope on the surface of a moon. There's some technical issues with the, the lunar you know regolith being very sharp, like glass. Yeah. Um, but if you can get beyond that, I mean, this nice stable platform provides us, and you could build huge structures, um, the same kind of structures you see on Earth, but you know now without the atmosphere to deal with. So I think that's kind of the cool thing, and then you know. Eventually, if we get really good at this, I would love to see people living on the moon. I mean, I want to go to a lunar colony. Right. But you asked me if I want to go to Mars, but I think that the, the answer is I would love like a week-long vacation on the moon. I think it's something special to see like an Earth rise. You know what I mean? Like just to take in the whole planet, like see your own whole planet at once. See, that's what would be, that would be the ad right there yeah. for a vacation on the moon. I would Watch the Earth rise. That moon base, yeah, moon base alpha. I would yeah, stay there. Yeah, I would do that. Yeah. Yeah, so so I think that's the fun. Yeah, it's a good amount. I mean, there's probably not going to be that much to do again, unless you're really working on, <laughs> on things. Maybe you and I would have some like technical like work to do. But right. I'd pay my way for like a you know a week's vacation. Be like, okay, you got to do do some moonwalks and like go repair some systems over here. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'd I'm in. I do that from the heartbeat. Right. All right. Let's talk about Mars. Let's do you're it. Very familiar with Mars. I love it. What have we learned so far? Is there any evidence of Life. So Mars, you know, the, the, the great thing is we have, a, you know, there's a series of missions that have gone to Mars. There's, there's uh, you know, the Viking missions in the 70s all the way to, you know, Curiosity most recently. And then now, or, you know, seven robots uh, at Mars, right? There's two on the surface, five in orbit. Um, the amazing thing is we're, we're still kind of building a picture about Mars. And I think that's really cool. Uh, scientists, you know, understand now that there was definitely water in the past, you know, four billion water years ago, an abundance of water. Mars was a warmer planet. That water would have been even maybe drinkable by our standards. So it's kind of this, this great place. The story is incomplete, which is kind of the fun part about you know, being a scientist or engineer in this field. Um, and, and so the next step really is after, okay, Mars, definitely habitable in the past, to you know, was there life? And that's like kind of the really interesting question to ask. So missions you know, going forward are gonna have to keep raising the bar, which is not just, hey, we know a little bit about the past, but how do we take this sample and understand it here in the context of the same way that we understand, you know, sample here on Earth? And that means laboratories or, uh, more importantly, really bringing samples back to Earth. Right. And so that can be really fun, you know, some fun problems to solve there. When you were growing up, did you have something that influenced you towards wanting to become a space engineer? Yeah, you know, growing up, I think there were a couple of things that I loved. One was Legos. Yeah, you know, of just a set, everybody, yeah. all engineers. <laughs> it's basically it's like yeah, I mean. it's you know it's a great it's a, it's a really an incredible thing when you think about it. This idea that you can build things you imagine, um, and of course like Legos nowadays are like an order of magnitude cooler than Legos when I was a kid. <laughs> like, they're like plastic and like didn't do anything. And then there was like techniques for a while. You remember yeah. like the ones you could like kind of make gears, gears into the system out of. And now there's like complete robotic systems. And I'm like this is, I like I'm, I'm very jealous of kids these days that they get to grow up with this kind of stuff. Um, but that you know that concept of like sort of in, you know envisioning and enabling at the same time, which is not a lot of really toys or, or things do that. Um, and then you know reading a lot of science fiction, I, I got I got hooked on the Star Trek bug pretty early. Okay. Um, it was great for me not just because I think I love the whole the future vision. I love that like that human exploration like that we all got together uh, you know along together and that as a as a planet we were going to go somewhere not just as a, an America kind of thing, which I you know I, I love. But at the same time. 
I like thought there were Russians, there were, you know, there were minorities, there were all these different people intermingling. Yeah. And I think coming from a multicultural household, that was a big deal to me. Like my dad's from Iran, my mom's from, you know, from the United States. And there was a lot of tension growing up, right? In the 80s, this is not a good time. It's still not a good time for the US and Iran. And I thought, like, oh, this future, this is what I want to kind of help build. Um, and I think that's where I really got, you know, bit pretty early on on the, the space exploration then equals Star Trek in some time. And like Legos equals engineer. And then it became this, you know, this thing. Uh, but I, you know, then, the, you know, there's experiences along the way. I had great teachers. My parents were very encouraging. Um, and all that sort of ended up in the, I guess, in the right place at the right time to come work on, on some very cool things. So what technologies would need to be developed to make space exploration easy, to take it to the next level? Right. There is, I think there's a couple of really big ones. Um, one, it depends, of course, whether we're talking robotic or human. Humans need a lot of things, uh, but some of the really cool ones are, you know, how do you take care of people millions of miles away uh, without, you know, access to everything that they need? And I, one of the really neat things I saw once was uh, some folks up at NASA Ames are working on this, you know, these devices that could synthesize all sorts of antibiotics out of just a few core ingredients. Uh, which is a really cool thing because if you think about it, you know, yeah, what if you get a cold or whatever and you're on Mars or all these little there's things. There's no pharmacy. That's there's right. No, there's, so yeah. if you have this box, you could, you know, create it. Uh, and the idea that, you know, that has a real world application here on Earth. Imagine I'm in a remote part of, of you know, the country or anywhere else on the planet. Yeah. And I want to provide access to people to these various things. Just go in, you know, that takes a little blood sample. It says, aha, I, I know you have this thing. And then here's it says, yeah, thing. here's your dosage of, of you know, whatever you need. Um, so I, I, I think that's a very cool thing. Uh, for, for, you know, for just generally speaking, I think energy storage is a real issue. Uh, we're constantly limited by how big, you know, batteries you can carry to, to things and how, yeah. you, how you survive night times uh, uh, on, you know, on Mars and other places. Because once we, you know, we want to go to a place that has a night time. We don't want to just like linger in space. Yeah. So you need to be able to have that cycle of energy. And that's a real, that's a real driver, you know. Lighter, and the same, same thing actually we see on Earth, right? Cars want lighter batteries. If you have to carry lots of batteries with you just to get around. That's your payload. That's, yeah, that's your payload. So that's a, that's a real big advancement. Um, and then, other, you know, otherwise, there's a, the great thing about space is there's an abundance of solar energy. So it's just how efficiently you can grab it. So a lot of those are kind of evolutionary things, but I think they, you know, they enable stuff. And of course, just cheaper access to space makes a big difference, right? If we can just keep putting more stuff up there, even if it is heavy, just as, as long as it doesn't cost much to get there, that's fine. <laughs> um, right now, the real reason that you're trying to save weight for the most part is because every pound you know, to orbit is $10,000, whatever it costs, and that's, that's what kills you. All right, let's say that energy wasn't a problem. Let's say that energy was infinite. Yes. You had an infinite power source. Yeah. How would that affect space travel? Well, it makes a big difference in how we can you know, propel ourselves. Um, so if we have the huge amounts of energy, we can have large ion engines that can just thrust for years on end. Um, and these ion engines, while they're not great for getting off planets, they are great for traveling between them because you're just constantly accelerating the whole time. Maybe it takes you a week to get to 60 miles an hour, but you're just going to keep yeah. chugging past 60 miles an hour, which is cool. Um, that, you know, that's a big part of it. I think the other part of it is, you know, for, you know, for coming from my kind of a, a curiosity background, right? We are limited in the day by how much we can do by power. There is, you know, there's a nuclear source on the back that's putting out around 100 watts, which is not much more than a light bulb. We're storing it in batteries overnight. We're doing other things. You know, we're trapping heat from it to kind of keep the rover warm. So that's free energy. Um, but in the end, it's you know, there's 2,400 watt hours to, to deal with in a day, and you've got to keep all your you know parts warm. You've got to drive. You've got to drill. You've got to zap things with lasers. Um, and and that's, uh, there's a time limitation. You only have three or four hours in a day that you can do that. So you could put lights on there, and I could illuminate at night, I could drive at night, for example. So those are some cool, you know, I, I think, yeah. You I'll could like drive it. all over Mars, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we could put it maybe past first gear. Yeah. The rover is <laughs> yeah. sort of designed to go in first gear the whole way. Now, to be fair though, <laughs> you are driving it from a different planet, so you wouldn't want to be driving too quickly. No, but, you know, we could also, you know, and, and I think you'll see that in the future we'll more of this, more autonomy on the rover to drive itself. Yeah, sure. uh, and, and in a way that right now we're kind of, the way we do it is it has to stop and take an image and assess the image and then you know, create a map of goodness and that takes you know, a minute or so. Um, in the future, you, know, you can just do that through continuous processing. So you image and as you're driving, you start processing the next image and creating that. So, and that power allows you to do that kind of thing too. Warp drive 
hyperdrive, quantum yeah. flux technology, infinite improbability drive. Yeah. Uh, do you think we will ever achieve that level of technology? I, you know, it's, it's possible. I'm not a physicist, so I can't say that for sure. I know that there are folks who are working on these things. You know, there was a kind of a, a one a couple of years ago where they said they brought the, you know, the power required for warp drive down by a significant margin. It was like, you know, an order of, of magnitude down. But it was still something like, you know, in order to travel some short distance, it would require the, you know, the energy from the entire planet of the Earth. So it seems like we're still a few years away maybe from this. But, uh, you know, the, the fact that this in theory works and, and the fact that we're still learning, you, know, I, I you, know, you probably understand this as well, but like the engineering is applied physics, right? We are, what we often do is take the, like the, you know, the idealized science version of something and try to apply it somewhere. So I think we're still learning a lot about just the base, you know, the core physics of it all and how that stuff works. Uh, even understanding how gravity works is still sort of, you know, up in the air. So I think that kind of stuff is, is hopefully in our future, but, you know, I don't know if it will happen anytime soon. Are you going to work on Europa? Is that the next goal to explore? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one, it's been a big, you know, interest in the science community for a very long time. Um, but what's really fascinating, not just about Europa, although maybe that's the, the most interesting of the places, but uh, about really all these, the, the things we're learning about these moons of other planets. That really, that these icy moons, uh, you know, as we're calling them, and they have a, you know, a shell of ice, but underneath that is a, a liquid ocean. And below that is a rocky core that's kept warm from tidal heating as they go around the, the planet. And what's really amazing about that is, is, you know, as we visited our own kind of bottom of the ocean, right, the hydrothermal vents, there's all this weird alien life down there that doesn't look anything like, you know, what we see here on the, on the nice layer of topsoil. Um, and yet these moons, you know, have the potential for that kind of thing, right? That there is, there is a, a, a body of water, there's nutrients in that water, there is, you know, a rocky core where, you know, warm chemicals are coming up out of the, the, the center of the moon. Um, and these are all the same things that we see on Earth. And where there's, you know, in, on Earth there's life. There's a chance for it to be uh, on the moon. So Europa is, is one of the cool ones. It's, a, you know, a very large moon of Jupiter. It's about the same size as our, our moon. Um, uh, but with, with as much, if not maybe more water than Earth. Uh, and it's got this icy shell, it's got, a, uh, you know, we think a relatively warm ocean below it, and this rocky core, so it could be all sorts of aliens down there. How do you get to uh, the warm core? How do you get to the ocean underneath the so icy the, shell? The first step is to understand how thick the, the icy shell is. We don't know that. We know that there's it's got to be some mobility, in other words, that, that the ice or water or whatever is moving. Uh, we could sense that with the pre previous missions of Jupiter. But what we need to know now is how thick the ice is, what sort of the, the, the surface is going to look like, and then once you understand that, now you have a chance to sort of, you know, burrow below the ice. Um, there's a drills, that's one option of getting down there, and then the other one is possibly just having something that melts its way down there. Right. So since we use nuclear power on Mars and other planets to keep, you know, the spacecraft warm, it's also a natural way of just sort of slowly melting your way down there. But the idea, you know, that in, in our lifetime that we could see submarines on, you know, these moons, <laughs> I think that's like the coolest thing. I mean, rovers are great, but like, I don't know, ocean submarines exploring Europa <laughs> and like, and Ganymede and all these places, that sounds even cooler to me. So technically, you are a rocket yeah. scientist. I guess, yeah. <laughs> a rocket engineer, space engineer. Space, yeah, sure. Okay. What, what's a typical day like for a rocket scientist slash space engineer? Well, the, the fun thing for me is it changes a lot in the course of a project. So when we're in early development, like right now in Europa, it's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of um, working with you know, tools like MATLAB and, and analysis and things like that to understand what are we capable of, how do things trade against each other. You know, if I, for example, I put larger solar arrays, what does that do? Yes, it gives me more power, but at the same time, it makes it harder for me to control the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things that you have to kind of balance in the early stages. And then as you move along, you actually get to start seeing the hardware come together. You start writing requirements on what things need to do. And then you get to start testing them and breaking them, which is my favorite part, to understand where things actually don't work anymore. Uh, and then finally, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're lucky and you stick with it the whole time, you get to see this, this whole thing operate uh, on the way, you know, as it's leaving Earth and then eventually as it arrives on another planet. And that's, you know, that's really the most exciting thing, I think, to see the thing that you helped you know, design and develop and test and then yeah, to nine actually years get to yeah, to actually making. get to see it fly though, uh, or drive or whatever it is, that's the the cool part. But it's really fun because in, you know no day is really like the the last day. Yeah, I mean each you know every year or so it kind of changes, and then eventually you get to it's like a new job uh, as it goes on, which is great. Yeah, each yeah. phase is something something new and different. And you know by the same thing, like every place and every 
you know, spacecraft is different. So you keep learning, right? Like it's not like we're building 10 Curiosities, we're building another rover. With Europa, it's a, you know, it's a completely different satellite with a completely different environment and like all different science questions to answer. So I feel like the fun part is that, you know, it's years of constant learning and, you know, and, and new challenges. And that's what we all kind of strive for, I think. You couldn't just send Curiosity to Europe. I it mean, the wheels are work. specially designed. That's right. Everything is optimized Laser around right being on Mars. Yeah. Um, yeah, we would, you know, probably the nuclear power would slowly melt us in the ice. We'd be like halfway in the ice <laughs> and sticking out and wheels just spinning. Yeah. So, yeah, have to have to come up with a completely different thing. As far as testing goes, you have a yard uh, yeah. at work with a full-size replica duplicate rover. Yeah, the, engin the engineering model, we call it. The engineering model. Yeah, called Maggie, which yeah. I don't know, still I don't understand where the name Maggie came from. Um, but Maggie, yeah, she, uh, she is a, a rover on Earth, looks almost exactly like Curiosity. A couple of modifications because, you know, the, the environment on Earth is different. We have uh, liquid nitrogen cooling in there because it gets a lot hotter on Earth than it does on Mars. Um, so there are things like that, but otherwise designed to basically replicate the experience of driving on Mars and, and operating software and hardware together uh, to make sure it all works. So a kid says, I want to be, yeah. I want to be like Bob Akfordowski. What, what advice do you have for the kid? I say do it. Um, it's a lot of fun. No, you know, the, the reality is it's, like, it's, it's a great place to be if you like being part of a team and you like challenges. Um, and I think that's true for probably a lot of engineering and science fields. Yeah. Um, but I think we're, you know, we're very fortunate uh, that at, at, at JPL and NASA there's a group of people who are really like, you know, focused together on making, a, you know, an incredible thing happen. And so it becomes not so much about like, you know, hey, where's this career point or that career point, but much more about like, how do I make this difficult thing work? Uh, and that's a really great place to be. We're very lucky that, uh, that that sort of happens for us. So I would say, you know, if you, if you like sciences or math, or even if you, that's not your thing, but you want to be a part of that, um, the great thing about working in a place like that, there we have, you know, lawyers, we have, uh, you know, finance people. <laughs> There's all these different people who, who do things like that um, to make stuff come together. And so if you're passionate about space, but you're, you're also really passionate about you know numbers and accounting. There's a place you can still be a part of that team. That's right. That does cool things. Yeah, and so it's a it's a great thing, and you and you and you feel like part of the team. And I think we all feel like it's a it's a it's a big bonding experience. I mean, you can't if you can't see from landing night how we're hugging and crying and everything <laughs> together. It's it's a pretty great family. So let's talk about the landing night yeah. for Curiosity. How did that become? I mean, that turned into an international phenomenon. How did it get to be like this thing that everybody somehow got behind? You know, for the most part, I was pretty focused on the job at hand, so I don't know how it all happened. Uh, I think there were a couple of things that really came together. There was a video, um, maybe a month or two before landing, called The Seven Minutes of Terror. Which uh, I remember. It was, that a, was a great yeah, video. Yeah, fantastic really good. video. Really had a, a couple of the uh, like, you know, engineers on the, the entry descent landing team. Um, it was, you know, directed by some, some folks in-house, uh, and they came up with this concept, and it had this almost movie trailer-like feel to it, right? It was this excitement, the, the tension building, and, and the drama of landing. And I think that, you know, the public saw that, and I was like, this is crazy. This looks like, you know, a Rube Goldberg contraption, like, <laughs> landing on Mars. Um, and I think that's where the momentum really started, you know, beginning to swell. I, you know, seeing that this wasn't going to be an easy thing, that this was going to be another moment. And maybe, you know, it also because it happened at a time just after the, uh, the shuttle retirement, you know, people were like, oh, maybe space is, we're done with space, yeah. um, which is far from the truth. But, you know, kind of a, a, a wake up call, a reminder that we were actually still doing, you know, really interesting things. And so I think it just kind of, that sort of kept, that momentum kept going and uh, snowballing. And eventually we ended up with, you know, millions of people watching a landing, like I said, on a Sunday night. Uh, and uh, competing against the Olympics, uh, of all things. Yeah, it became we, like a viral sensation. We, I, you know, I think so, which is great. It's a, it's a real testament to, to, I think, people's excitement and to, to the way, you know, if, if we do a good job of showing people what, what we're doing and how difficult it is, that they can actually appreciate it more. You know, we, we, we often talk about space and people, you know, think it becomes routine. 
Um, totally. It's, it's yeah, far the Apollo missions. Yeah, Apollo, like, the, oh, yeah, Apollo another the one team. Shot the same thing with the shuttle. Same thing with the shuttle. And it, the, you know, the, the wake-up call is that this is really difficult stuff to do. Even the stuff that we're making look smooth is never <laughs> that easy. Um, and there's all these amazing stories from the shuttle program of like how close they were to getting into orbit and like almost never, you know, not quite making it, but they, you know, yeah. found some clever way of doing something at the, the last moment. So that's there's there's all these incredible times, and you know, it's all covered up by a word like uh, systems are nominal. And you're like great. <laughs> <laughs> and that covers all sorts of like, you know, gems of like crazy work that someone has to do to get something to happen. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's just nominal. Now, the, you know, with the Apollo missions, space shuttle, there was always the human element that, you know, you would think that people would say, oh, I'm, I identify with these people, this person, right. and, and they're in danger or they're doing this crazy thing. And here, curiosity comes along is, not a person, no. is a robot. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but the, we have seen Wally, -E, like so. I mean, we have we <laughs> love robots. Right. It's short circuit. I mean, I, mean, a history. I love robots. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I know, but you know, the average person. Like, yeah. Um, somehow they they managed to really care about this mission. Yeah, that was very special for us. And I, you know, I, you know, I think all of us who work on the project thought. Curiosity has a personality. Yeah. Uh, all robots really do in the end. Yeah. Uh, they definitely don't quite behave every time like you want them to. Uh, but at the same time, it's you know the fact that the public was on board, and I think it, you know whether it was just crazy contraption or whether it was seeing the people behind it, right, talking about what what had had to do, what steps it had to take, and that became the part that you know people resonated, with, knowing that people had invested themselves in this. Even though it wasn't physically a human going there, although I think that would be, you know, a, all of us around the world would be like, you know, awake at whatever hour it is to see a Mars landing. Yes. Um, but it's the same, you know, by the same time, this, this little robot, you know, relatively speaking, little. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah a little robot. This little robot. <laughs> this this little of one my ton car. robot, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, capture people's excitement. That, that's, it was really awesome for me just because I, I, I you know, I didn't, I don't think any of us expected that. Yeah, I think I agree. You know, it's, it's, Partly, I think it's a story of the, the robot all on its own landing right. so far away. Right. Because I think I agree that, you know, the moon, we've been to before. But Mars, yeah. nobody's ever been there. This, right. yeah. this robot is the first thing to land on Mars. So that's right. part of the coolness of it. Definitely. The moon is a lot closer. It's a lot easier to get to. Right. But it's dependent on the Earth resource. That's, so yeah, the moon is, is really not an ideal place. There, there's, there is some water uh, ice trapped in probably in craters at the, at the poles. So it's not a, you know, a completely all at a loss for things, but you really would have to create a lot of stuff uh, in place or bring it from the Earth. Uh, whereas Mars, you know, the, the gravity is a little bit more like Earth's. Um, astronauts complain about on the moon how is kind of they lose their balance a lot because at low levels of gravity, you. You experience right. it, but you're not quite, it's not your natural, you know, uh, way of, of operating. Again, imagine with time you get better and better with that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, Mars is, is, well, Mars four billion years ago looks a lot like Earth. Yeah. That's the thing. So, we, you know, we know it has a lot of the things that Earth uh, has today. And it's, you know, it can probably be fairly self-sufficient. Right. Uh, maybe not perfectly so, but, you know, at a minimum, Impact and, and uh, you know it's, it's still our sister planet. Still get a lot of sunlight. That's uh, right. The uh, the day is very close to. Very it. similar. That's right. It's 24 hours and 40 minutes. So it's it's weird when you're living on Mars time on Earth. I remember that was a, a strange experience. But uh, <laughs> but it's so uh, wait you so bright. when you were working on on uh, Curiosity. Yes. You had to live on Martian time. Right. So the the thing with with Curiosity is you're trying to operate during the Martian day because that's when you have light to see, you know, the surroundings and inspect and investigate. So you're living at a time whenever the rover's awake on Mars. And so that, because it's 40 minutes, you know, difference each day, that your day slowly moves through the Earth day by 40 minutes every time. So if it's 8 a.m. one day, it's 8.40 the next day that you show up, and then 9.20, and then... So for three months we did that, which is, it's fun because the whole team gets to do it, but it's, you know, you miss, you miss out, like, on hanging out with your friends and finding places to eat at four in the morning, which is kind of <laughs> more of a challenge. So you landed a, you and your team, yep. landed a nuclear-powered, semi-autonomous robot that is equipped with a laser, with a laser yeah. on another planet. Yeah. How do you feel? I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's honestly like, you know. That, that's like science fiction, but in real life, man. We are 
very fortunate to get to do some of, I think, some of the coolest things uh, in the world today. Or, or not in the world, I guess, uh, <laughs> in the case yeah. may be. Um, and it, yeah, no, it's, it, one, it's a, a tremendous experience because I invested so much and I worked on that project for nine years before landing. Um, many of the people on that team have been on there, you know, five, ten years or whatever. So it's a, it's a whole group of people that, in some ways, you know, I've kind of grown up with, right? I mean, this is like the first job I had. We're all working on this together, and at the end, you know, this baby that we almost created ourselves is now has to land itself on Mars and, you know, show us that it's, we, you know, we kind of raised it right. Uh, and, it was, you know, I think that's why during the landing you see the kind of the raw emotion of like the joy and the tears and everything coming out at once because it's just like this, yeah, we, we did it. Like, we, yeah. we raised our kid. And not only that, it's you raised your kid no. and your kid was successful and continues to be That's successful. Right. And everybody in the world is all watching this in, the re in yes. real time. Yeah, it's like the Truman Show. Yeah, um, No, but it's, it, no, it's absolutely, that's right. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I knew a little bit like going into that night that yes, people would be watching, but I never really imagined how many people would be yeah. kind of watching the thing. And it was, you know, a Sunday night. So if you're in the US, it was 10.30, you know, here on Pacific Coast, 1.30 1 in the morning. New York, but there were people in Times Square, you know, school night, yeah, cheering it on. There were people around the world, uh, and that was, yeah, it was a, for me, it was a very like human moment. Like, it was something that we, again, it kind of that Star Trek element of it all, but like oh. it was a thing that we could all share together. Like, yeah, humans, we do really great things when we really try, and I, I think that was like one of the most exciting things about that whole thing for me is that oh, yeah. the demonstration of what we're capable of when we, when we really put ourselves to it. So maybe it doesn't take Mars. Maybe it just means we got to do it here on Earth, but. All right, let me ask this. Um, a lot of people look to that moment where you landed the rover as something that reignited a passion for space exploration and space travel. What do you think is the future of space exploration? I think that there's a couple of big parts. One, you know, it's going to be more and more international. Um, Curiosity, you know, instruments are contributed by, you know, multinational teams. United States, France, um, there's uh, Spain, Russia, and everybody's involved in this. The idea that this wouldn't be, you know, multinational seems crazy to me. That we're not going to try to collaborate with the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese and all the spacefaring nations to make this happen because this is a tremendous, you know, thing to do. We're talk we, we, we talked about it's, it's expensive, it's going to be risky. Why not get all these great, you know, people together who know how to do this stuff and try to make it happen? And again, if, if the goal is to, you know, make a better version of ourselves, let's do that well, you know, start on the right foot. Let's have all the people represented in this place, you know, in, in some way or another. Even if the first, you know, four people aren't going to necessarily be from every different place in the world, eventually we kind of do the same way we do on the International Space Station. I think that's the really cool thing about it. Um, I think that's part of it. I think the other really amazing thing that happened, you know, kind of started happening in the early 2000s, really, but this very, you know, amazing time for corporate space, that there's companies like SpaceX, there's companies like Planetary Resources, all these, these places that are realizing that there is also a, a, you know, a commercial value to doing space. Um, that whether it's tourism or whether it's enabling new technologies or cheaper satellites and all these things actually add up to something really important. Uh, and I, you know, the idea that you know, we have maybe cheaper access to space, um, the idea that we can now get resources potentially from, from off Earth. You know, the asteroids have water and minerals and everything else. That's an incredible thing to me. And I think that has immediate impacts on our own planet. The idea that, you know, we could stop kind of stripping our planet of all these resources and instead be like, well, we can create, you know, a nice clean planet, <laughs> but find all this stuff just floating in space and just bring it back, you know, home just for, right for the picking. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. So I think that kind of space in the next 10, 20 years is going to be really cool. Uh, I think those guys have a lot of like, very fun, like almost frontier-like uh, things going on. Um, all right. Well, I think I know the answer to this mm. question already, but um, Star Trek or Star Wars? I'm a big I'm a team Star Trek. Team Star Trek. I love Star Wars too, but I think Trek is just it's to me it is that vision. It's the it's the it's the future I want to be a part of part of it. Um, I think Star Wars is a it's a it's like an exciting you know maybe a more dramatic story, um, but I think Star Trek is our story, so that's kind of why I like it so much. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs>
We'd also like to thank our sponsors who helped make this episode possible. Microsemi, Vichet, and Phoenix Contact. 